Salah ad-Din rose from nothing and nowhere to suddenly becoming the vizier. Why was the Abbasid Caliphate so fragmented? The French general Liotte, yeah. goes to the grave of Salah ad-Din. Salah ad-Din. I have returned. Yeah. I have returned. When then he gave this speech and yes. the Khalifa cried. And nothing happened. And nothing happened. <laughs> the Caliph had no power. And the Caliph at that time was getting married and he was more concerned about his new bride. So tell me about the chivalry that uh, the West knows Salah ad-Din by. Today, I want to ask one big question. Do we need another Salahuddin to turn around our fortunes? Salahuddin Ayyubi, the 12th century general, statesman and sultan, is mythologized for his victory over the Crusaders in 1187 at Hittin, and ultimately the reclamation of Islam's third holiest place, Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. At a time when the Muslim Ummah is undergoing what many suggest with good evidence, to be the worst period in Muslim history, his name and mission remains an inspiration. Yet many of us, to which I must add my name, have scant knowledge of the man behind the myth, the prevailing social and political climate that made him, who he was and the geopolitical context within which he acquired his sense of mission. Like all historical heroes, there are periods of highs and lows. In their lives and as we dig deeper, we find complexities that do not fit neatly into the idealistic rendering of history we may have. To help me understand the great Salahuddin Ayyubi, I have invited Dr. Abdurrahman Azam onto our show. Dr. Azam has authored several books, including Salahuddin, The Triumph of the Sunni Revival. He is a scholar specializing in Islamic history, and we are grateful for his time today. If we are to recreate a Salahuddin, maybe his society and the men with whom he surrounded himself and the backdrop of a greater Sunni revival will aid us to understand the chivalry with which he is famed and the mission of the man himself. Dr. Abdurrahman Azam, Jazakallah Khair for joining us. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam and thank you so much for inviting me here today. Well, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to to uh, to discuss uh, this great man Salahuddin. Uh, so I asked this very big question at the beginning uh, of my of my monologue. There, do we need another Salahuddin? And I want you to keep your answer to the very end. But it seems to me what you're trying to do in your book is to place Salahuddin as part of a broader revival. You call it a Sunni revival. So let's start here. What's going on in the Muslim world, at least in the heartlands of Islam, for there to be a need for a revival during that time of Salahuddin? Well, I think the first thing to say is, do we need another Salahuddin? And I appreciate that we're going to be talking about this uh, over the next hour or so. We're going to eventually reach a conclusion, which uh, we can discuss towards the end. But the very question, do we need another Salah ad-Din, implies a couple of issues that I'd like to touch on now, and then we can look at the uh, historical Salah ad-Din. Please. And in a way, the fact that we're talking about Salah ad-Din, we're actually talking about two different people. We're talking about the historical character, the Kurdish warlord, for a better, what better word, who lived in the 12th century and who, as you mentioned, uh, gained the glorious victory in the Battle of Hattin in 1187, and following that, managed to restore Jerusalem, which had uh, fallen in the First Crusade in 1098. So, 88 years after the First Crusade, Salah ad-Din successfully restored Jerusalem, and who, as we will be talking, uh, was very much involved in the realpolitik of the day, the infighting, the you know all the politics and back and forth. Mm. There's a second Salah ad-Din that I'll be talking about, and that is the Salah ad-Din who was a child of the Sunni revival, if I can put it that way. Right. And we are going to be discussing what the Sunni revival is and what role he played in it, especially with his um, building of madrasas, the role that madrasas played. So this is what I would call the intellectual history, the ideological history that created the Islamic world, the Islamic firmament, which in which Salah ad-Din obviously emerged. Naturally, given the drama of the uh, conflict, of the battles, especially the Third Crusade, where Salah ad-Din comes face to face 
well, as much as face to face. They never met with the great Richard uh, the Lionheart that we, of course, all know and the battles between Richard and uh, Salah al-Din. People tend to focus on the battles. Mm. To a large extent, I think the other Salah al-Din, the one who actually played a very important role in what can be termed the restoring of Sunni orthodoxy, has a more profound legacy to give us. Really? And that, if we are going to draw parallels with today's world, is one that we can touch on, because I think that is where the relevance tends to be, more so than the historical character, even though that is far more dramatic. There's a third Salah al-Din hmm. that emerges, and that is the symbolic Salah al-Din, the Saladin, if I may. And today, if I use the term Salah al-Din and Saladin interchangeably, yeah. it's simply because he is so famous, yes. and because his name has transcended the, you know, Islamic, non-Muslim world, so people recognize him. Yes. And the real question that one needs to ask ourselves, and I appreciate we're not going to answer it for a while, yes. is the question itself. When we say, do we need another Salah al-Din, what do people mean by that? Do they mean, do we need somebody who's going to come back and recover Jerusalem for the Muslims? Mm. Do we mean somebody who's going to come back and do so in a tremendously chivalrous and valor way? Because, of course, he was famous, deservedly so, for his um, dignity, decorum, and the way he treated his enemies. Hmm. The question is a loaded one. And are we talking, when we say Dunida Salah al-Din, are we talking about the historical character or the symbolic Salah al-Din? Hmm. So having made that brief introduction, having parked that question, which we will come back to. Yes. We go back to the historical Salah al-Din and the age in which he grew up. Yeah. And the conditions that really led him to um, emerge. It's important to stress that although we can claim that it was an extremely um, chaotic time in history, that it's a time of great uh, turbulence. There are a lot of petty kingdoms, a lot of petty you know, rulers, it was no more turbulent than perhaps other periods in history. And we can, again, be discussing that in a bit more detail. And this idea of, you know, the narrative of decline and Salah al-Din restoring that decline, mm. I think he would have been um, quite surprised by that. I don't think he would have, you know, anticipated the question of decline or not. Really? The reality was the reality. People were grabbing power. They were looking for uh, to protect their own interests, their family interests, because this was the nature of how things were. Mm -hmm. Now, very loosely speaking, the Muslim world was under, as much as one can be, under the rule of the caliph. And the caliph was the Abbasid caliph who mm -hmm. was largely in Baghdad. The caliph himself had very little power simply because he had no armies but what he did possess was a legitimacy, a legitimate right to rule, which, of course, went all the way back to the family of the Prophet, mm -hmm. and he, did, he bestowed this legitimacy on those people he needed to rule for him. Mm -hmm. And they tended to be uh, warlords, military commanders, uh, largely from Asian steppes. So the most famous, of course, the Turks were the Seljuks who came into Baghdad and other uh, military leaders. And there was this kind of relationship between the two that they they were allowed, and these were loosely termed sultans maybe, or other terms, mm -hmm. and they were often allowed to um, take as much territory as they wanted on the condition that they paid homage to the caliph. His name was mentioned in the Friday prayers, his name was minted on the coins, and in return, the caliph would send them uh, cloaks of uh, honor, which they'd wear, robes of honor, which they'd wear. And this would be a sign that, you know, Sunni Islam and Sunni Orthodoxy was in place. Mm. The time that Salah al-Din, or we should to understand Salah al-Din's age, of course, we need to go back 100 years or so before, just to give you a very brief historical introduction. Yes. Salah al-Din was born in 1136 or 37, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and we need to, just keep that in mind. So the first crusade came and Jerusalem fell in 1098. Mm. 
So 50 years, 40 years or so before Salah al-Din's birth, Jerusalem had fallen. And I'll just say that at the moment, and we'll come back to that point when we talk about the Crusades. Salah al-Din was born in Tikrit, in modern-day Iraq, and he was born to a Kurdish family, a warrior Kurdish family, who were within the realm of this Abbasid Caliphate, uh, but uh, who, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, were under the jurisdiction of uh, Nuruddin and Zenki. Is that is that right? Uh, to, to to an extent, uh, also Nuruddin's father, Ahmadiddin Zengi, uh, yes. because Ahmadiddin Zengi was the man who was actually ruling at that time mm. Mosul and northern uh, Iraq, really, and yeah. uh, had been making encroachments. His uh, Zengi's uh, who, a typical warlord who looked for legitimacy towards Baghdad, but who of course did not need Baghdad for any military power. Yeah. And Zengi was making encroachments into Syria. His great dream was to capture and to rule Aleppo. Right. To keep in mind, the cities that one key has to, which I will be repeating again and again, the most important cities at that time were in the northern Syria, there was Aleppo. Hmm. There was, of course, Mosul and Iraq. Hmm. There's Damascus. And then there's Egypt. Hmm. And one has to keep in mind that these were the main cities that needed to be controlled. Right. And these were the where the main struggles were. Right. So yes, Salah al-Din was a Kurd. It's an important point to make because yeah. often people forget that. Mm. And it's an interesting point because it was a time when the Turks were ruling. Right. The main warlords were Turks. And really the Turkish-Kurdish, you know, struggle, if mm. we call it that way, or the way the Turks looked on the Kurds has not changed much. So even till today, you know, when, you know, there's this dispute between the two, there was no doubt that the Kurds were looked down upon. Salah al-Din came from what you would call a humble background, uh, a noble background, but not a wealthy one by any means. His mm. father was a man called Najm din and his uncle was a man called Shirku. Mm. And at an early stage, the two of them went and uh, entered into the camp initially of Ahmad din Zengi, but then of Ahmad din's son, the great Nur din Zengi. Mm. This was a time when Zengi uh, was controlling Aleppo, and Zengi was looking to unify Syria. But to understand that, we need to take a step back. Mm -hmm. The Muslim world at that time was split among two great ideologies, two great powers, and two different ways of viewing uh, their history and their theology and so forth. The two main centers of power were, as we mentioned, Baghdad, and these are symbolic centers, more so than perhaps political ones. And the other, of course, center was Egypt yeah. and Cairo. And this was the time when Egypt was under the Fatimid Ismaili rule. Now, we know the Fatimids came from North Africa. Nine, um, around 969 or so, they came to Cairo. They established the city of Al-Qahira. And for 200 years or so, Egypt was under Ismaili rule. They, once, they were the ones who built the Azhar. And one forgets that the Azhar, which today is one of the great Sunni bastions of orthodoxy, <laughs> had initially started its uh, life as a tool for Ismaili propagation. Yes. And there was a real struggle for the hearts and minds and souls of the Muslim world. Who would triumph? Would it be the Sunni um, ideology, Sunni orthodoxy as such, or would it be the Ismaili one? So there was this intellectual debate that was taking place, struggle. The battlefield, to a large extent, was uh, in Syria. Um, and we will touch upon it when we talk about Salah al-Din's entry into Egypt, because in fact uh, the dynamic would change, and it was Salah al-Din, of course, who perhaps his greatest contribution uh, was uh, he restored Sunni rule to mm -hmm. Egypt. So the Salah al-Din, when he was growing up, was looking at, and at that time I should add, there was also other Shia dynasties in Syria who were actually... Um, they tended to be non-Ismaili Shia, so probably 12 Shia, okay. Imami Shias. Yeah. And uh, most famously, the Buyids, who at one point even took over Baghdad and ruled Baghdad as a Shia city. Mm. So the caliph who was struggling, uh, we start off with of Qadr and other caliphs who were struggling to maintain their power, had to find an ideology which would help them fight against this Shia Ismaili uh, encroachment. And gradually what emerged 
was a Sunni ideology. Now, again, if we go back to our histories and think about it, the most significant uh, character who emerges at that time was one of the viziers of the Seljuks. The Seljuks were Turkish warlords who came to Baghdad, Tugrul Beg and Alp Arsalan, and they effectively ran the show for the caliph. He gave them legitimacy, and they're the ones who had the military control and power. The vizier that emerges at that time was a man called Nizam al-Mulk. And I think to a large extent, when we talk about the Sunni revival, in as much as we can talk about the Sunni revival, and I should stress that it is not a you know, coherent revival in the sense that it's not homogeneous. Mm. It went back and forth. People disagreed with many aspects of it. So one should not think about it as a kind of well thought out curriculum or such. Mm. Nizam al-Mulk, when he came to power, understood the reality of the Muslim world. He saw very clearly the threat for the Sunnis that the uh, Ismailis were posing ideologically. But he also realized that the Muslim world itself was tearing itself apart. The Sunni Muslim world was tearing itself apart with the extremely vitriolic and divisive uh, fighting among the Madahib, in particular between the Hanbalis and the Shafi'is in Baghdad oh. and over very, uh, what to us today may appear rather obtuse theological issues, but for them this was a matter of life or death. So. Give me, the, give me an example of theology, the Ashari, Kalam, the created wow. the creation of you know the Quran. Yes. Things which appear as theological points, but to them yes. this was, you know, really a question of life or death. And of course, you know, the caliph would take sides with one or the other. Yeah. And this was causing huge disharmony. Baghdad was divided into the quarters uh, of the you know, so the Madahab would not pray with each other in different mm -hmm. mosques and yes. so forth. Yeah. And Nizam al Mulk was aware of that. And he realized that things had to change because this con constant divisiveness, this constant narrowing down of Islamic ideology, this constant takfir of other people would actually was causing tremendous damage. Now, accompanying Nizam al-Mulk was one of the great geniuses of Islamic, his civilization, al-Ghazali. The two, of course, knew each other very well. So whereas Nizam al-Mulk was the statesman, the politician, the diplomat, the real politique. Al Ghazali was the thinker, the ideologue, the man who really understood what needs to happen. And his Ihya Ulum al Deen is a remarkable, remarkable piece of writing. Yeah. And I think one can honestly say that every Muslim today owes a great debt to Al Ghazali's contribution. Al-Ghazali very, very briefly recognized the threat and danger that was being posed to Islam from within, mm. ideologically. And I'll give you an example. We're often talked, and this is a very, you know, if not a controversial, a very heated debate. He understood that philosophy had to, had to have a role within Islam. Yeah. Now, of course, people have said that he, were, you know, he was against philosophy to have the philosopher and so forth. Of course, I disagree with that argument. But Ghazali knew that every strand of Islam, as long as it conformed to an orthodoxy which was consensual, consensus-driven and which was accepted, mm -hmm. had to be accepted. So if one had a philosophical bent, or if one preferred kalam, if one had some Sufi inclinations, or one preferred fiqh, Islam had to make room for all these thoughts. Mm. Islam was an umbrella which covered a lot of wide-ranging thoughts. And that is why his Ihya Ulum al-Din is a work of genius. Mm. I should add that Ihya Ulum al-Din was controversial. It was burned by the ulama in Cordoba and other places. Yeah. But Ghazali had the courage and the vision and the grace from Allah to understand that a new Sunni orthodoxy had to be built. And what emerges now in Islam is what more or less what we have today. We we really do follow a lot of what Ghazali was writing about, which is basically an adherence to one of the madahib, but an acceptance that all the other madahib are equally valid. Right. So some are people are Shafi, some are Malki, and so forth, Hanafis or Hanbalis. 
It's a kind of acceptance of a mystical side of Islam, even though some may want to practice it more, some less. Mm. And it's a sort of what I would call a rational, logical, Ash'ari thinking towards Islam, which is that you accept certain arguments about, you know, but in a way you accept other people's opinion with a bit of philosophy thrown in. Mm. So in a nutshell, this was the new Sunni Islam that was beginning to emerge, and it began to emerge in opposition to this Ma'ili threat or danger or debate and started to articulate itself. Now this is, we're talking about Ghazali dies in 1111, yeah. so 20 bit years, 25 or so years before Salah al-Din's birth, so keep that in mind. Yeah. And so the, the, the world intellectually, the Islamic world intellectually at that time was grappling with these concepts. There's an extra element that one needs to touch upon before we get into Salah al-Din. Yes. And that really was the main contribution that Nizam al-Mulk did. Ideology on its own was fine, but how do you cement this ideology into practical infrastructure? And this was done through the madrasas. Nizam al-Mulk initially created the most famous madrasas, which were known as the Nizamiya. Initially in Nishapur and further east, his most famous Nizamiya was in Baghdad, where Ghazali taught, where mm. other great, great scholars taught. Mm. And then very gradually, uh, it, the, the madrasa concept began to spread from Iraq into Syria, from Syria into Egypt. The main spread of the madrasas into Syria was largely led by Nuruddin, Nuruddin Zengi, before his advent to power. There were very few madrasas in Syria, and during his lifetime, he built many, many. And not just him. Everybody participated in madrasas at that time. Mm. They were built for pietistic reasons. They were built mainly for to build up, you know, what we call a graduate, although they're not really graduates, of, of people who were familiar with, uh, with Islamic thought. Madrasas were schools of law. Mm. They taught Islamic law and as much as they taught anything we should not think of them as university or school where you just graduated you went as many times or as little as you wanted to you had a very uh, close relationship with the professor of that madrasa uh, you got an ijazah from them so you would read a book or a man you know with them and eventually you would you know drop in or drop out as much as you wanted but this remarkable period actually saw and this is quite a Remarkable point. There are more madrasas being built than mosques. Right. This is a time when people build madrasas. And the spread of madrasas in the Muslim world from Iraq to Syria was happening completely independently of the Crusades as they were arriving. And this is sometimes where history is quite remarkable because often the Crusades, which we're going to touch upon is largely a Western obsession and often does not look at what was taking place within the Muslim world at the same time. So at the same time as the Crusades were arriving, as Jerusalem was falling, mm. the, Muslim, the Sunni revival was emerging from Baghdad, was spreading across the Muslim world, so, uh, mainly to Syria, and was manifesting itself in madrasas. And later on in our talk, I will touch again upon the madrasas because they actually play the fundamental role to secure Salah al-Din's position and the recovery of Jerusalem. So I've got two questions to ask you on the basis of, um, uh, Jazakallah, it's a fantastic backdrop that you've developed. It's very evocative, actually, how you have, you've explained the environment within which Salah al-Din was born. So I suppose my first question is, why? Why was the Abbasid Caliphate so fragmented by the time Salahuddin is born, you talk about these warlords uh, that uh, were carving out chunks of territory for themselves and their clan and building dynasties. Um, and the Abbasid Caliph, uh, his writ over the rest, over the Muslim lands was, was fairly tenuous, fairly weak, uh, as long as they paid homage to him and you know, gave khutbah to recognize his authority. That was sufficient uh, from from a from a standpoint of, you know, fr from a allegiance perspective, for the status quo to continue. So I suppose my first question is, 
what led to such creeping inadequacies within a once uh, uh, tremendous empire, tremendous caliphate? We have to go back and question that narrative, whether the caliphate was ever, you know, homogeneous. Uh, Don't forget yeah. that I have, there's a third empire that not mentioned at all, which is Andalusia. Yeah. So we had three centers of power, not two. There was also the Umayyads who were actually, uh, as you know, the Abbasids came in 750 and they massacred the Umayyads who were the first dynasty after, the, you know, the first companions of the prophet. And uh, they had established the first caliphate in Damascus and it was the Abbasids who moved it to Baghdad. Mm. And after that, the Umayyads broke away and established the Andalusian dynasty, which paid absolutely no homage or loyalty at all. They had their own caliph. They, so there was a time when there were three caliphs. The khutbah was being read in the name of three yeah. caliphs in Baghdad, in Egypt, and in Andalusia. And they were all claiming legitimacy. Right. So the, the idea of a powerful Muslim empire really doesn't stand the test when you look at it very carefully. The, to answer your question quite, if not cynically, quite mm. realistically, mm. the caliph had no power. He had no army. He had no men to fight. Mm -hmm. Equally, the empire was huge. How do you control what was happening in Khorasan or in Egypt or Yemen or North Africa when you're ruling from Baghdad? Right. And this really brings down the question of what the role of the caliph was. Was it to endow legitimacy or was it to rule? Clearly, the facts on the ground meant that you need generals, you needed military commanders. And if your military commander was ruling, let's say, North Africa or Egypt or the Hejaz or Yemen or Syria. Very soon you start accruing enough money and wealth on your own terms. And of course you have to send money back to Baghdad and Baghdad sends you, you know, some kind of legitimacy. And, but really as long as you paid homage on Friday and you recited the name of the Caliph in the Friday prayers, you were left alone. Mm. And so the reality politique, the reality was that the center will never, could never hold. Right. The Muslim empire was simply too large, too fragmented, and to a large extent, and this is an important point, the fragmentation of the Muslim world was its strength. And one of the remarkable things about Islamic thought and ideology as it was growing at this time was that concepts such as Islamic law, the interpretation of Islamic law, the practicality of how you apply Islamic law to daily practice, was taking place across a huge territory mm -hmm. which had very little contact with each other. And yet, what emerges was a consensus on what, how Islamic law should be implemented. Right. And this is really, if one were to look at the miracle of Islam, I would say this is one of the great miracles, how Islamic law emerged through independent consensus without really having as we know, there's no pope, there's no papacy, there's no one saying yeah. this is... And we, the Abbasids tried, the Mehna, of course, when Abbasids, you yes. know, they tried to implement yeah. it, you know, a trial, and this is how Islam should be. Yeah. But Islam is too fragmented, too disorganized, and that is the strength of the religion. But you say that's the strength of the religion, but of course, the Crusaders at the end of the 11th century have conquered uh, a really important section of, of Muslim land, and yet... You describe the obsession, if that's not a strong word, the obsession of Muslims at the time were the Fatimids rather than the Crusaders, who seemed to be a greater existential threat, maybe, to the Muslim yeah. world than Fatimids. Let me, let me challenge on that point. <laughs> the narrative is that the Crusaders were a threat to the Muslim world. Yeah. I can assure you they were not a threat. Really? Let us look at what happens. The, first of all, they arrive. And the first response, as we know, which was quite a, you know, a weak mm -hmm. response, if yeah. one can look at it that way, yeah. what is known as the counter crusade or the jihad does not come till much later through Nur al-Din, and we'll yeah. talk about that. Yeah. The first response is very interesting. Yeah. But the, rea the reality is this. The crusaders arrive. The Muslims, to a large extent, can't figure them out. They cannot tell whether these are just another Christian raiding party or they're here to stay. There were people like Abu Tahir al-Sulami, the people who wrote books like Kitab al-Jihad, very early on, who actually said, be careful. These are not your typical raiding parties. This is 
a deliberate campaign, a strategy that's coming. And I'd like to make one quick point here. And again, going back to the dates, 1098, Jerusalem. 14 years earlier, in 1085, there was another crusade that took place, but in Andalusia, in the Iberian Peninsula. Mm. Toledo, which was a hugely important Muslim city, mm. fell to the Christians. And the fall of Toledo sent shockwaves among the Muslims there and directly led to the intervention from the Murabitun and Yusuf Tishfin and all that and the and that story. Right. So one needs to look at the Islamic world as a whole. What took place in Toledo was followed te- a decade later in Jerusalem. So there was definitely a movement in Europe, crusader movement, which was as organized as it can be, mm. with certain aims. The question is why did it not have an impact on Muslims? Mm. The crusaders never really ventured into the hinterland of Islam. They came down the coast, and if you look at it, they came, they marched down the coast. They only went inland as far as Edessa, and Edessa, which is one of the kingdoms, they established kingdoms there, they established Antioch and Edessa and Jerusalem, others. And Edessa, which is the one that was deeper inland, Mm. was the first city to fall back to the Muslims. In 1144, when Zengi, Muradin's father, Mm. retook Edessa. But other than Edessa, the Crusaders made no encroachment at all inland. The big cities of Islam, Aleppo, Damascus, of course, Egypt, and we'll come back to Egypt because Egypt was critically important in the story. Yeah. Yeah. Hardly felt the Crusaders. Baghdad, there's this famous story with the, you know, the ulama, the Syrian uh, ulama, mm. outraged by what was happening, went to Baghdad to yeah. complain to the caliph. Yeah. And the caliph at that time was getting married and he was more concerned about his new bride. than yes. the, So was there an existential threat? No, there was no real existential threat. This leads, of course, to the most controversial, debatable points. How important was Jerusalem? Yeah, because today Jerusalem is extremely important to us. And, you know, when just the other day, when the, um, uh, the Libyan foreign minister met with mm. the secretly with the Israeli foreign minister, I think yeah. it was, and, and discussed potential normalization. There were riots on the street, right? And mm-hmm. people were hurling mm-hmm. uh, uh, banners uh, talking about the centrality of Jerusalem to Muslims. So we haven't forgotten Jerusalem, even though we feel we're in a weak state. Was that not the case? I mean, you, you mentioned the, the scholars. I think I remember reading the account of Qadi Harawi, who, who went from, traveled from Jerusalem in Ramadan to, yeah. uh, to the court of the, of, of the Khalif in Baghdad and to make an entrance. He, mm. This was a midday in Ramadan. He ate a date mm. to, shock uh, to shock people. And then he gave this speech and yes. the Khalifa cried. And nothing happened. And nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's, let's look at it. Yeah. So the first point to make is existentially there was no real threat. Mm. The Muslims did not intermingle with the Crusaders. They kept us apart from them. Yeah. Apart from the coastal cities which the Crusaders seized, they made very little inroads in the Muslim world. Yeah. And the vast majority of Muslims had very little dealings with them. Right. Far more impactful on Islam were the Mongol invasions. So one should never, so I, I repeat what I said, there is a kind of Western obsession with this. Uh-huh. Okay. Jerusalem is interesting yeah. because symbolically, of course, very important. And what emerges, and let's keep in the time frame, 1098 to 1187, 88 mm. years between the two. Mm. In those 88 years, the emergence of the idea that Jerusalem needed to, to be restored mm. started to emerge. Right. Why it emerges goes back to the point I made earlier. It was not the warlords. It was the ulama and the clerics and the scholars who started to advocate for it. Mm. And we'll touch upon that when we look at Salah al-Din. Yes. But Jerusalem itself, as a city, can I say strategically and militarily, was not important. Right. To lose Jerusalem was tragic, but Jerusalem could be regained. To lose Aleppo or Damascus would have been an absolute disaster for the Muslims. So militarily, the Crusaders did not have the impact that we think they had. We just think they had because of the history, the way history has been written, and because the West loves the stories about Salah al-Din and so forth. 
So let's go back. They arrive. They launch a bloody, bloody campaign. Mm. They capture Jerusalem and they massacre the Jews and the Muslims. In this Jews. is in 1098. Yeah. yeah. And this, for the first time, the Muslims wake up. But as we said earlier, at that time, Syria was between the Fatimid Ismailis. Aleppo was Shia, but it was not Ismaili Shia. Damascus was uh, uh, under the Buri dynasty. There were different dynasties. And there was no center which could hold Syria together. Mm. And to a large extent, Syria is the front line. Because, of course, that is where they, you know, Syria and Palestine is where they, of course, came face to face yes. with them. And the man who emerges now at that point is Nuruddin Zengi. So we, as we said earlier, Nuruddin comes, he starts building these madrasas. He starts surrounding himself with some incredibly intelligent, profound, articulate ulama. Mm. And there's a change. There's definitely a change. Now... Whether this change is because of the Crusades, yes, because the Muslims, no matter how disorganized they were, you're not going to allow somebody to come to your house without eventually trying to say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. It took a time. It took a while. So the Second Crusade was in 1140s. And at that point, the Second Crusade, which happened because Edessa fell to the Muslims. So the first city to fall back was Edessa, and right. that was in 1144, and that was Nuruddin's father, uh -huh. Zengi, uh -huh. launched the Second Crusade. Salah al was, what, 10 years old at that point, 8, mm -hmm. 10 years old. He was living in Damascus at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And in the Second Crusade, they actually attacked Damascus. And this caused real shock to the Muslims. Right. And they didn't get very far because they just, they were so disorganized, they couldn't. But at that point, Damascus realized the threat that was happening, and they immediately asked for Nur al-Din, who was in Aleppo, to come. And for the first time, Aleppo and Damascus became under one ruler. Right. Now, to understand the whole geopolitical story, yes. and I'm trying to simplify what is really a complex Please, argument. Uh, yeah. For the Muslims, and they understood this quite early on, so from the 1140s, they figured this out. For the Muslims, to be able to regain Jerusalem, for the Muslims to be able to restore a Sunni rule over the heartland, which is Syria and, of course, Egypt, they needed to put together Mosul, Aleppo, Damascus, and Egypt under the control. It was not enough because Damascus and Aleppo were always fighting against each other. Egypt remained under Fatimid Ismaili rule. So the first part of the story is when Ahmad al-Din Zengi, Nur al father, tried to move from Mosul into Aleppo. The second generation, Nur al-Din, his son, takes Aleppo and goes down. And for the first time, Damascus and Aleppo are in one hand. And this scares the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem because suddenly they start seeing a threat. So what do they do? And this is really where we come to the crux of the matter to understand what took place. To counter the threat of Damascus Aleppo creating a pincer movement, they turned their attention on Egypt. Right. To a large extent, Egypt was the key to everything. The wealth of Egypt was enormous. Why? What is it about Egypt that Men, makes it so well? Money, wheat, food. It was this, you know, basket of, uh, so, you know, all the money that was coming from Egypt was an extremely wealthy, wealthy, wealthy place, mm. uh, you know. So the thousands upon thousands of soldiers that Egypt could draw upon, and we'll touch upon the armies that Salah had to So Egypt also controlled the Red Sea, had access on the Mediterranean. It was enormously wealthy. Mm. The treasures of the Fatimids was astonishing. Really? The, you know, the gold and silver and, and, and the fact that they could just go into Africa and to Yemen. They had access. Whoever controlled Egypt controlled the Hejaz. Who controlled the Hejaz controlled Mecca and Medina. Egypt was mm. the center of power. Can I ask a question about the mm. Fatimids? I mean, what type of government did they did they have? Was it uh, did it include Sunnis, or was it very exclusive? Uh, uh, and unfortunately, today we see in Iraq, for example, you know, you have a, a Shia government, and I'm sure there are Sunni governments like this, of course, as well. But a Shia government that excludes the Sunnis. Um, how would you describe the Fatimids and their um, their approach to the Fatimids? Uh, very interestingly, we're a tiny minority in a vast ocean of right. Sunni Muslims. Yeah, The vast majority of the Egyptians were uh, either Muslim or 
Christian, and by Muslim, I mean Sunni Muslims. Yes. The Fatimids very early on realized that they could not rule Egypt on their own, and they needed the Sunni administrators and, and clerics okay. to rule. So the vast majority of people working in the Fatimid chancery mm. were Sunni Muslims. All right. And they were serving a country which uh, the ruler, the caliph, was a Fatimid caliph. Mm. And the Fatimids more or less left the Egyptians on their own. And that is why when eventually, and just to I'll continue the story then we'll answer your Please. question. Yes. So when Nur al-Din captured Damascus and Aleppo and the crusaders or the Franks in Jerusalem turned their attention, the real power then who controls Egypt? If Nur al-Din succeeded in capturing Damascus, Aleppo, and Egypt, yeah. that pincer movement would have been completed and Jerusalem would have fallen. On the other hand, the Latin kingdom, with their king, a man called Amalric, mm. knew that if they could break the axis, which is the Fatimid Ismaili Sunni axis, and keep Egypt under the control of the Latin kingdom, yeah. then there's no way that Nur al-Din had enough men and power to fight them. Okay. So their whole attention was to Egypt. Now, Egypt, the Fatimid... By the time Nur al-Din comes to power and Salah al-Din, his father, as I said, and his uncle were now working for Nur al-Din and Salah al-Din grows up in Nur al-Din's camp. Mm. He's, he works and he works his way up and becomes one of the noblemen in Nur al-Din's camp. The Fatimids were in a very, very weak position. Mm. Largely because, as I said, they actually relied on a lot of Armenians. A lot of the viziers were Armenian. Many of the viziers were Sunni Muslims. Yes. And because in Egypt, there was now emerging a very strong Sunni movements which were under, undermining the Fatimid rule, particularly in Alexandria. Were these Sunni movements influenced by the greater Sunni revival you talk of? Uh, Salah had, yes, eventually, and we'll touch upon that because it's an important point. Alexandria was a city which was uh, Sunni. Mm. And there you start seeing the contact and movement of scholars and ulama from Syria into Alexandria and to a large extent also from Morocco into Alexandria because yeah. anybody doing the Hajj route would come from North Africa into yeah. Alexandria. Okay. So very soon these contacts started to emerge and, and what we see are direct channels of communication taking place between Damascus, between Baghdad and Sunni elements in Egypt. Mm. And without a question of doubt, people like Ibn Masal, Ibn Zubair, and we'll talk about them when Salah uh, emerges in Egypt, because that's where he really makes his entry into history. Yes. Uh, he comes into the spotlight. That is the first contact that we start seeing that there was a Sunni movement that was largely based in Alexandria and also in old Cairo and Fustat around the Amr al As mosque. Mm. And they were in constant communication with what was happening in Syria. And there's no doubt they were sending messages of support to Nur al-Din saying to him, you've got to come in because the Fatimid's rule is about to collapse. And if the Fatimid rule were, were, would collapse and was actually taken over by the Latin kingdom, this would be an absolute disaster because if Egypt came under the Christian crusader rule, or Frankish rule, mm. then of course this would change the game dramatically. So to get this uh, straight, uh, the Fatimid's request... Uh, Nur al-Din Zanki to come and support them in their campaign against the Crusaders? At the end, yes. The last Fatimid Caliph, a young yeah. man, 20, 21-year-old, and I added, ah. realized the danger. Okay. Because he realized the danger that Amalric and the Crusaders, we always were Crusaders, but these were Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. They were already living in the yeah. region. And, and these, course, these were Franks of these are French... Franks Franks, well, the word Franks is used generally, ah. Germanic, Frankish, right? Um, but largely from France and Germany, Okay, um, but largely French. Yes. Um, they were based, of course, in Jerusalem. This was the main capital. This was the main city, Latin Kingdom. Yeah. It was ruled by a man called Amalric. And Al-Adid, the Fatimid Caliph, realized his rule had become so weak that there was a real threat and danger of Egypt falling to the Christians. Yeah. And this actually is an important point that although we talk about the tension between the Ismailis and the Sunnis, and we talk about yeah. tension in Sunni Shia, yeah. there comes a point where the Ismailis did not want this to happen. They would, they would rather Nur al-Din help them because they were still Muslim. Yeah. They viewed themselves as Muslim. And I'm, I do question sometimes the um, 
not not the demonization, but the kind of emphasis on the difference between the two. Mm. Because in the time of crisis, al hadid young man, clearly a pious person, sent out an appeal to Nur al-Din and said, if you do not come and help, then Egypt may well fall to the Christians. Right. And this was an Ismaili writing to somebody who championed the Sunni cause, yeah. which to me says that the love of Islam transcended the sectarian division. Yes. And I think one has to be a bit more nuanced and subtle when one reads history, yeah. because sometimes we look back and see black and white, when yeah. in fact it was perhaps... And this again, you know, when Salah al-Din becomes vizier, he actually had a good relationship with al-Hadid. So explain that. How does Salah al-Din become the vizier of a Ismaili Sunni caliphate? You know, Salah al-Din was a lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> and if one, I, one, is, one recalls Napoleon's comment about the need, you know, when they asked him about his generals, he said he wanted lucky generals. Yes. Salah al-Din rose from nothing and nowhere to suddenly becoming the vizier. And very young, in his 20s, late 20s, probably early 30s, I'd imagine. Yeah. So when Nur al-Din got the appeal from al adid to come and save Egypt, mm. and at the same time, he was also in touch with the Sunni communities in Egypt who were saying to him, you've got to come because the mm. situation is critical. Okay. He sends his army into Egypt. And the head of his army was Shirko, Asad al-Din okay. Shirko. who was Salah al-Din's uncle, a very tough, fierce-looking man. Yes. And they have three campaigns before they get to Egypt. The first twice, and the first in the first campaign, Salah al-Din is told to hold Alexandria, and there's a tremendous siege of Alexandria where the Sunnis of Alexandria stand with Salah al-Din, but eventually Alexandria has to, because there were still elements within the Fatimid Egypt that did not want the Sunnis. A lot of the people there, like Shawar, the viziers, who are actually in conflict with the Caliph. And the Caliph in the Egypt is similar to the Caliph in Baghdad. Mm. Weak. No military power, right. some legitimacy. Right. So there were elements in Egypt, as we see, when Salah al-Din becomes vizier, they try to kill him several times. Mm. Though, of course, there were elements. Egypt was too big and too important for it not to have different divergent political struggles. Mm. So it took them three campaigns, but eventually they come into Egypt. The vizier of Egypt at that time, Shawar, is killed by Shirku, and Shirku becomes the vizier of Egypt. And Salah al-Din is his number two. He's proven himself as a young man. He's fought in a couple of battles. He's, he withstood a fierce siege of Alexandria where he showed his loyalty. But he's a footnote in history. Nobody knows who he is. He's a young man called Yusuf. And there's these anecdotal stories about him refusing to go back to Egypt hmm. and him saying, you've got to go back. And, you know, the usual trope that we get in Islamic history where the hero is a reluctant hero. <laughs> I don't believe that. Yes. So, so I just, just mm. want to explore that just one little bit further. So, you know, they've, they've, uh, um, saved, uh, they've saved Cairo, they've saved Egypt from uh, uh, the potential crusader onslaught, and um, they're rewarded, Shirku is rewarded uh, by an Ismaili, Shia... But it was not the first time. I mean, yeah. there were many of the Ziyars before Shirku were Sunni. Ah. No, no, there were many, many viziers who okay, were Shia. Okay, so this was not an odd thing. Not okay. at all, not at okay. all, not at all. Yeah. The, kind of, the vizier was an administrator who administered the country, the majority of whom were Sunni Muslims. Mm. The uh, Ismaili madhab was the prevailing madhab, mm. but it had very, there was a big disconnect between that and the actual day-to-day -day life of the Egyptians. Right. Uh, we had, there were Armenian viziers, there were Sunni viziers, there were Shia viziers, Imami Shia mm. viziers. Mm. So he was certainly not the first, uh, he wasn't even the first Kurdish vizier, because right. there was a man called Ibn Salar who was actually really? a Kurdish vizier Sunni. Yeah. By no means was he the first Sunni vizier, nor was it exceptional. What made it different was that behind the political decorum and diplomatic parlance of courts, what really made it different was this time it was Nur al-Din and everybody knew that Nur al-Din wanted to, 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 to cut that Fatimid link. Mm. And that cutting of the link, of course, was naming the Abbasid Caliph. Yes. So before the Fatimid Caliph would appoint Sunni viziers and they would run the country for him because they knew how to run countries. Mm. But now he was having to appoint Shirko as vizier because he really had no choice. Right. Shirko had the army. What he was could, a strong man. He was yes. a strong man. You're going to yeah. make him vizier or he's going to topple you. Yeah. And there's no doubt that Shirko would have toppled the Fatimid Caliph except 
Within a few months of Shirku becoming vizier, he dies. Mm. And then there's a power struggle. Who becomes vizier? And Salah al-Din, through some uh, backroom you know, maneuvering and uh, cajoling, people like Isa al-Haqqari, even Salah al-Din's uncle from his uh, maternal side has pretensions and so forth. Salah al-Din emerges out of, into the spotlight of history. And for the first time, really, when you start reading his life, he, you know, he took, he had a small administrative role in Damascus before. He was very much a footnote. Mm. For the first time, Salah al-Din becomes vizier and the Fatimid Caliph is delighted because he finds this young man. He thinks, oh, you know, I can handle this person. Right. He's not Shirko. Shirko was a tough, tough man. Right. And Salah al-Din, who was quietly spoken, had not yet proven himself, is appointed vizier by the Caliph in the expectation that somehow he can control him. Malleable. He's Malleable young. and so forth. But yeah. of course, everybody, but at that time, everybody's eyes were not on Egypt, but on Damascus. Right. What Nuruddin is pulling the strings here. He's the most powerful ruler in Islam at that time. He's pulling the strings. He's telling, there's no way the Fatimid Caliph would have appointed Salah al-Din had Nuruddin not agreed to it. Okay. He would have said, no, don't do that. I don't need, I want so-and-so to be vizier. Yeah. So we have this position where Salah al-Din is the vizier. He is reporting back to Nuruddin and he has a friendly relationship with Al-Adid. And then three things happen. Well, the first thing that happens is that there's huge uprisings against Salah al-Din because they're testing him. Mm. So you're a young man, you claim to be a vizier, let's see how tough you really are. <laughs> and you get, first of all, Amalric will not accept this because he realized at that point that there's a real threat here of mm. Syria controlling Egypt. Mm -hmm. So he launches campaign after campaign in Demiata to uh, invade Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Salah al-Din has to test, his, again, his metal is tested. He sends out his uncles and his uh, family. His father arrives and his brother, Turan Shah. And they have to fight the, that off. And then there's a slave rebellion, the Nubian rebellion, which starts off and they try to burn down Cairo. Okay. And he has to fight. So as soon as his, he became vizier, he opened a door where people wanted to see how tough is this young man? Can he really become the vizier of what effectively? is the most important province in the Muslim world. He succeeds. He holds his nerve. The first few months are really, really difficult. And he eventually establishes himself. The it's, question of how, sorry, yeah, the question please. of how he established himself yeah. brings up a very interesting point. How did somebody who was Kurdish, who had no contacts in Egypt, had no infrastructure, no knowledge of Egypt, become vizier, and how did he fight off? And what we start seeing emergence now from the shadows are the Egyptian and Arab Sunni ulama, administrators, clerics, who had been serving under the Fatimids, gradually emerge and support Salah al -Din. He could right. not have succeeded unless he had a whole background and back in a staff of people supporting him. Mm. The most famous, of course, being a man called Al-Qadi Al-Fadl. Right. Al-Qadi Al-Fadl was really Salah al-Din's brains. From the moment he emerges in Egypt with Salah al-Din, he remains close to him. And Salah al-Din once uh, claimed that I did not conquer these lands by my swords, I conquered them through Qadi Al-Fadl's mm. pen. And Qadi mm. Al-Fadl recognized that. He was the consummate administrator, the consummate bureaucrat, He's the one who was the conscience of Salah al-Din. He advised him. He was, came from Askalan. He was Palestinian originally. Mm -hmm. He had a hunchback, and people used to make fun of him because of the hunchback. Mm -hmm. And for years, he served as a bureaucrat in the Fatimid administration. But like him and others, they were Sunni, and they were biding their time for Egypt to return to the Sunni fold. Right. So when Salah al-Din emerges, and it would have probably been Shirko, had Shirko lived, Salah al-Din emerges, they suddenly think, this is the man we're going to tie our destiny to. Mm. And they're the ones who help him navigate the extremely dangerous and turbulent waters of early rule, mm. when there are many assassination attempts against him by the Fatimids, who did not want him to remain in power because they realized this was the end of the Fatimids. My, then, yeah. Go ahead. My okay. understanding is, is that Salahuddin set out after dealing with his initial challenges to his rule. He... he became a very effective administrator of, uh, of, of Egypt. I mean, is that a, is that a fair um, 
appraisal of, of he Salah wasn't, He wasn't an administrator as yeah. such. He, he allowed people who are brilliant administrators right. to... You cannot run Egypt unless you know Egypt. Okay. You need to know about the land of Egypt, where the money is, how do you tax the land, the farmers, the, mm. the, the water levels of the Nile. There are so many particular issues dealing with Egypt, which are so unlike. This is a man who had no experience in yeah. administration. Yeah. No. Salah Haddin surrounded himself by people. And one of the most striking things about his character is the people who befriended him as a young man remained with him all their lives. Right. And that is a great testimony to his um, qualities. So people like al Qadil al-Fadil, they're the ones who are administrating. I don't think Salah al-Din, as a Kurd sultan, vizier, would have paid too much attention to the administrative side. He was incredibly generous right. to the point where he, Qadil al-Fadil, later on when he was controlling the whole Muslim world, would never tell him how much money there was left in the chancery because he knew he would spend it on helping the poor. He was right. a remarkably generous man. Right. And as we all know, Salah al-Din died penniless. Mm. He had no money at all at the end. He gave it all away. Yeah. Let's go back to Egypt. Please. So Salah al-Din now is in Egypt. He is in a position of authority as much as he can. And then what we have is the emergence of him reporting back to Nur al-Din and Nur al-Din saying to Salah al-Din, well, why have you not got rid of the Fatimid Caliph? Uh -huh. Why is the prayer still given in the Abbasid's name? Yeah. And there are many people who look and say, well, there was tension between the two. Between Salahuddin and Nuruddin. Nur yeah. To a large extent, there must have been. I think one has to be realistic. This is politics at its uh, most uh, consummate suf level, uh, most direct level. Mm. Salahuddin found himself ruling over a country which was far wealthier than Syria. Salahuddin was a man who had to put down rebellion after rebellion. Did he have ambition? Did he have political ambition? Ambition is something that was fundamental to your survival. If you did not have ambition, uh, you could not survive. Mm. When he realized, he saw his uncle, Shirko, he must have seen uh, how life was in Syria. Ambition to establish a dynasty? Probably not. I think his loyalty to Nur al-Din was unquestionable. Really? I don't think he would have broken his word to Nur al-Din. Mm. But he wasn't going to be pushed around. And I think this idea of somehow a tension existing, these were two extremely battle-hardened, tough veterans right. with egos, with ambition, with uh, interests. And, you know, people, Syria does not tell Egypt what to do. Egypt does not tell Syria what to do. These are two powers now. And to a large extent, he, he was reporting to Nur al-Din. Mm. But there was some... Um... There's some discussion about in, in the in the academy about Nur al-Din raising an army to potentially to fight Salahuddin. Is that I not... don't think this would ever have happened, no. Right. I don't think so. I think there was tension between them, but there's tension between every political ruler. I don't think there was real that it would never have come to that. Right. Largely because nobody wanted to fight each other when there was a threat of Amalric. Hmm. And then of course, going on with the theme of Salahuddin being lucky, yes. to very lucky events took place, for him at least. Mm -hmm. Within months, Nur al-Din dies, followed by Amalric. Mm. So within months, the two people who were standing in his way were no longer there. Right. Both leave problematic legacies. Nur al-Din's death meant that Syria was going to be fragmented again. Had Amalric lived, then he would have definitely, he was a formidable king of Jerusalem. Really? He would have taken advantage of this fragmentation and mm -hmm. all that would have been Aleppo, Damascus, Cairo axis would have broken. Mm -hmm. So from the moment that Nur al-Din dies, the, the game has shifted. Whereas a time when Nur al-Din controlled Aleppo and needed to control Damascus and Egypt, now, Salah al-Din controlled Egypt and needed to control Damascus and Aleppo. Right. And he needed to position himself as the protege and as the heir of Nur al-Din. Mm. The problem is Nur al-Din had a son, Salah, a young man. Mm. And as soon as Nur al-Din dies, the Aleppans grab this young boy and take him up to Aleppo, knowing we will resist Salah al-Din. Mm. And they detested him. They used to call him a dog that barked against his master because he was a man who... They, you know, he was a Kurd, he was not a follower of Nuruddin Zengi, and they could see that he was trying to establish his own dynasty mm -hmm. here. 
And that was the first challenge that Salah al-Din faced. How do you restore order into Syria? And how do you convince the Syrians that you are not ambitious for your own sake, but because unless you control Syria and Egypt, you will never conquer Jerusalem? Right. And that is the second chapter of Salah al-Din's life as such. So the first chapter is now he's established in Egypt, so the next part is how does he move into Syria? And potentially the most controversial chapter in a way because, uh, again, I've, I've heard it being said that now Sunni Muslim turn against Sunni Muslim. And, of course, many of his incursions into, into Syria were, were not, um, uh, you know, did not lead to bloodshedding, but some of it did. And there was interfighting between, between Muslims. I mean, how do we understand how do we reconcile this? We reconcile it by being aware of the real politic right. that Damascus and Aleppo did not want a Kurdish warlord to come and rule, that the, so the followers of Nuruddin wanted to establish their own positions of authority. Mm. So there was the overall ideological and the overall strategic understanding that if the fight was going to be taken to the Latin Kingdom and right. Jerusalem was to be reclaimed, then Damascus and Aleppo had to align with Egypt. The trouble is neither Damascus nor Aleppo wanted to align, and also Mosul. These are the three cities. Right, right. To Salah Hiddin's credit and genius, uh, he managed to align them without bloodshed. Okay. Now, this, we're now coming, now for the first time, Salah Hiddin is emerging. Hmm. He's no now a fully, a man who was Sultan of Egypt, vizier or Sultan of Egypt, of course, at that time, and there's, there's, a, sorry, there's one more death, which is the death of the Fatimid Caliph. Of course, yes. Very fortunate, 21-year-old, he dies young, and that yes. means that Egypt has come under the Sunni rule. And so Egypt now gives uh, allegiance to the Abbasid Caliph. For the first time. For the first time. Okay. For 200 years. Right. And Salah Hiddin does something else. He starts building madrasas ah. straight away. Right. So keep in mind that all the madrasas that Nur al-Din built in Syria, yeah. it was Salah al-Din who brings the madrasas into Egypt. And very quickly, over years, there are many madrasas being built by Salah al-Din, by the men around Salah al-Din. Also, I have to say, by the women around Salah al-Din's family, his mm -hmm. sisters and his wife, and they built many madrasas. And this starts to emerge. So for the first time, there's a consensus of Sunni administrators and the thing about the madrasas, and this is where the most fundamental point to understand, there was a coming together of the ulama who studied Islamic law, who taught Islamic law. Mm. They're the ones who issued the fatwas. They're the ones you went to in case you had a question. They gave you the, you know, the advice on it. Mm -hmm. And there was the administrators who were actually running the government. Right. What happens is that once you build these madrasas, the same person running the government would now have a madrasa background and training. Really? So for the first time, you had this convergence between a classically trained Islamic Sharia scholar mm. who also had an administrative position in government. Right. So people who, his names are familiar now, the main biographers, the main secretary of Salah al-Din, other than Qadi al-Fadl, a man called Imad al-Din al-Isfahani, mm. or Baha al-Din al shaddad Fascinatingly, if you look at them, both studied in the Nizamiyya in Baghdad and then came and worked with Salah al-Din. So over a period of time, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, as a madrasa starting to be built, as more madrasas were being built in Syria and in Egypt, mm. hundreds and thousands of graduates started to emerge who were ulama trained and administration. There was some you know, controversy to that because mm. it meant that they became professionals. Right. And whenever alim takes money, then of course there's this dispute whether, you know, whether scholars should take money or not take money. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, Salah al-Din surrounded himself with people who had a madrasa background and who were now ruling. And that movement, that, you know, that kind of coming together right. of the madrasas, of, of Islamic knowledge with administrative expertise, is what gave him the platform to build his, his ideology. Okay. These people would not let him go. These were the people who every day told him, you've got to take Jerusalem. Right. 
So Jerusalem still loomed as a important aim. It starts emerging in the time of Nur al-Din right. and, the, and, the, and the volume increases. But what is fascinating about this early period is that it increases from the ulama who are whispering into the military leaders' ears. Mm. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You've right. got to capture Jerusalem. Nur al-Din and Salah al-Din, of course, both instinctively wanted to do so. Mm. But without the vocal, the administrative and the religious background, that people around him mm -hmm. were actually advocating for it. And before you know it, a movement starts madrasa-based, ideologically driven, with the focus of you've got to capture Jerusalem. Okay. The trouble is, as we've seen, you cannot capture Jerusalem until you align Aleppo, Damascus, and Mosul. And now he's achieved this. At what age? At what age? 1170s, 11, uh, he, would, he was born in 1138, so he'd have yeah. been now in his 30s and 40, 40s. Okay. So he's now getting into the element, his seniority. Yeah. It took him uh, 10 or 11 years to slowly, painstakingly bring Aleppo under control. Very yeah. generous terms he gave yeah. them. So there was one or two battles where he gave strict instructions that nobody would be um, killed after the battle. Mm. People were pardoned. He spent a fortune winning them over because he knew but here is a fundamental point to make. The people of Mosul and the people of Aleppo hated Salah al -Din. Right. Twice they tried to kill him by sending the famous assassins yes. to kill him. Yeah. And there was one time where they came as close, they hit him on the, you know, cut his cheek. Wow. And yet, and here one gets finally to the battle, getting towards the battle of Hitti and the Crusades. Yes. Yeah. The fundamental point was this. For Salah al-Din to win and defeat Jerusalem, he needed to put together an army which was large enough. So he needed people from Mosul, from northern Syria, from Egypt mm. to come together. The trouble is, the larger the army you have, the more difficult it is to hold it together. Right. Because these people came because they wanted the spoils of war. Mm. Because fighting in those days was seasonal. You only fought for a while. Yes. You needed the infantry. These were people who were farming land, so they would only come, fight for a few months, and then return. So on the one hand, he needed to gather this huge army, because a small army could not defeat the uh, crusade, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Franks. Yes. On the other hand, the bigger the army, the more headache it brought him. Right. He had no power at any point to force Aleppo and Mosul to send men. Mm. How? He's not going to go and fight Mosul. Uh, and yet... These people who hated Salah al-Din constantly would send troops to fight with him. Okay. This can only be understood and explained by understanding that there must have been an overall vision. They must have recognized that this man was unlike other men. Mm. And there's a very interesting enough that very early on, the Franks understood this. Right. There was a famous historian called William of Tyre uh -huh. who early on noticed Salah al-Din as a young man. And he actually writes in his chronicles, this man is not like the others. You cannot buy him. Really? This man is clean and he's determined to get Jerusalem. So flesh that out for me. What, what did he see in Salahuddin which marked him out as an exceptional person? The fact is, to answer that question is problematic because you need to be in his presence to understand it. <laughs> yes. Salah, it's easy to see us, but Salah was not. Salah al-Din was not a great administrator. Mm. Salah al-Din, despite what people say, was not a great general. He led the armies, but the main fighting was his nephew, Taqi al-Din and Taqiyuk um, Biri. There are many things about what Salah al-Din was not. What Salah al-Din had was a genius to win people over, a tremendous, tremendous uh, honesty, and he would confound people just by being honest. Because this was a time when political machinations and Machiavellian you know, detours were needed to survive. Yes. And this was a man who simply told the truth. So he didn't play the dirty didn't, game. He didn't play any games at all. He, really? went, he walked straight down. He was completely honest. Mm. He was extremely merciful. And his greatest act of mercy, the one that cemented his name and his fame, was eventually when he defeats mm. and wins over Jerusalem, there's no massacre. 
In 1098, the streets of Jerusalem, flood, yeah. the blood was spilled down the streets of yeah. uh, Jewish and Muslim blood. In 1187, Salah al-Din is totally forgiving and merciful. You've, in, in a sense, you've ruined the film here because you've uh, jumped ahead to the, uh, <laughs> the Jerusalem. Spoiler alert. But, spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah, before, be... before we get to that, of course, he did have a very major setback at the Battle of uh, mont Yes. Uh, and um, I read somewhere that it was seen to be a tactical and strategic error mm. of Salahuddin. Just to briefly take briefly, me through that. Briefly, yeah. one has to mention one of the most fascinating characters, King Baldwin. Right. Now, we've all seen the Ridley Scott film. Yes. We've seen Baldwin. Yeah. He was a leper king. Yeah, yeah. He was the son of Amalric. Yeah. Uh, as a young man, it became obvious there was something wrong with him because he, could, he would not feel pain. Right. And they noticed that something must have been wrong, and he had leprosy. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that you cannot read the life of Baldwin without being moved by his piety, by his strength of character, by his courage. Right. At the age of 16... So when, Baldwin, so when Amalric dies, Baldwin becomes king of uh, Jerusalem and his uncle, a man called Philip of Flanders, comes to, and together they, 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 they want to attack Egypt. Again, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. Mm -hmm. But then there's a dispute between them and Philip of Flanders goes off to besiege Hama and Salah al-Din sees his opportunity. Baldwin, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, he was just barely king. He, the regent was a man called Raymond of Tripoli. Mm. Uh, clearly beginning to suffer from his illness. The main army had left Jerusalem to go fight in Hama, besiege Hama. And Salah al -Din in Egypt says, this is my opportunity to finish this off quickly. Right. I will never get another chance to fight a 15-year-old young boy. Mm. Bolton gets onto his horse and astonishingly, he could no longer use his left hand arm and so he used to navigate on his horse and control his horse with his knees because his right hand, he had a sword. A 15-year-old young man led the army. Mm -hmm. So then, as soon as Salah Hadid moves out of, takes his army into Syria, mm -hmm. Baldwin leaves Jerusalem and heads towards Ascalon. Ascalon, Ascalon, Ascalon is the most important city because it controls the entry point to Egypt from Palestine. Right. And at first, this appears like a strategic error because if, if, if Baldwin goes to Ascalon, that means Jerusalem was completely defenseless. And Salah Hadi notices that, can't believe his luck, for sure overestimates, uh, you know, overconfident. And instead of grabbing Jerusalem, he disperses his army and they start raiding Ramla and other places and they start pillaging and taking and Baldwin notices that. And then he launches an attack on Salah Hadin's army and very cleverly, using local knowledge, Salah Hadin's army was far large. I think Baldwin's had 300 knights and Salah Hadin had several thousand, so it was a much larger army. Yeah. He drags Salah Hadin into a fight in an area which was very muddy and marshland. And that is why, so he knew that larger numbers were actually a hindrance rather than a help. Mm. It was pouring rain, it was the middle of November, I think, uh, wet weather. And very cleverly, Baldwin uh, hoodwinks Salah Hadin and drags him to a battle he did not want to fight, or on Tehran he did not want, uh, not want to fight. Hmm. And he inflicts a defeat. At that point, Salah Hadin's army breaks apart and they get scattered. And Salah Hadin himself is nearly killed by a charge of Franks who get as close as his bodyguards. And then Salah Hadin disappears. He goes off. He gets lost in the desert, which is effectively the Sinai Desert there. And um, the army is completely fragmented. And it's Al-Qadi Al-Fadl in Egypt who comes to his rescue by sending Bedouin Arabs who knew the terrain very well. Yeah. And they bring Salah Hadin back to Egypt. So when we talk about heroic courage, one has to admire Baldwin in that battle, Monjizar. But there's a very important lesson here, two very important points to make. The first one, this was in November. By February 1178, mm. four months later, Salah Hadin was back in his saddle with a new army mm -hmm. marching again. And that important point is this. The Muslims were fighting on their home ground. Right. They had the hinterland of men. And that lesson meant that the Muslims could afford to lose battle after battle. Mm. 
but the, the Franks could not afford to lose any battle. Their mm -hmm. army was always going to be much smaller. Mm -hmm. They could not afford to lose anything. It's like one can take a boxing analogy. Yeah. Mm. You know, they, Salahdin could take many punches. Within three months, he had replenished the men he'd lost. Mm -hmm. He's back in his saddle and he's saying, okay, let's have another round now. <laughs> now, militarily, the Franks, you know, in, in Jerusalem, their army was much smaller. For them to survive, they could not engage with Salahdin's army because fighting was seasonal. All they had to do was remain in a defensive position, mm -hmm. knowing that after a few months, Salahid's army was too big to, to stay on one place. There's no food, there's no supply lines, it would disintegrate. And right. he'd have to go back and the winter campaign, which season would come. Mm -hmm. So the first lesson that they had, and that's what made Baldwin's attack so incredible, is because he went against the contrary advice, which is do not engage a much larger army, just wait for the season to come and it will blow itself away. Right. And this will take us to Hattin. Yeah. Because Salah Hattin knew that if he gathered, and after Manjizar, it took several years, Baldwin dies in 1185, he's a very young man, of course, from his illness. Yeah. He had no children, and there was a huge dispute in Jerusalem, and then Baldwin's sister marries a man called Guy de Lusignan, who becomes the king of Jerusalem. Right. And Salah Hattin sees his opportunity, and then, as the film Remember, if you remember the film, the great evil, Raymond of Châtillon, emerges, who's this great you know, nemesis of Salah al-Din. And he's the one who, quite astonishingly, attacks Medina. He has this harebrained plan to go to Medina and to steal the Prophet's you know, body from right. Medina. And it's, I can imagine the shock this will have caused to the Muslims. Yes. So Salah al-Din finally has his army. He's controlled Mosul. He's controlled Aleppo. They pay homage to him. He has no real control other than that because you can't. Uh, he's got Damascus. He's moved to Damascus now. He's living in Damascus. He's got his brother ruling Egypt in his place. Mm -hmm. He's gathered his army, but he has to land a knockout blow. If he cannot get the Crusaders to fight or the, the Franks to fight, then that army will again fragment every year. Mm -hmm. And there's only so many times you can do that before you lose credibility because his whole credibility was I'm here to fight the holy war. Mm. You've got to support me because I am honest and I'm fighting the holy war mm. and I will regain Jerusalem. Right. But if you keep saying that and you don't deliver, then the people in Mosul and Aleppo say, we told you he was, not, he was a nobody. Mm. You know, we are supporting Nur din's people, not Salah al-Din. Yes. So the challenge in 1187 is when he finally got his whole army together. And there's a very interesting period just before then where he fell seriously ill in northern Iraq. Yeah. And for a while, he had a tremendous fever, and he's about to die. And there was a real concern because having put all this mosaic in place, very painstakingly, don't forget, 10 to 12 years of painstakingly winning city-state after city-state and saying, are you part of my coalition? Mm. He falls ill, and Al-Qadi Fadl, and there's this beautiful scene where Qadi Al-Fadl, his closest advisor, goes to him, and they hold hands, and he vouch that if God were to restore him to his health, nothing would distract him. Right. We come to Hattin, yes. the most famous scene, yes. Hattin. If Guy de Lusignan, with his smaller army, how does Salah al-Din convince Guy de Lusignan to fight? If Guy de Lusignan does not want to fight, there's very little Salah al-Din could do. Again, luck, not luck. Did he win Hattin? Did Guy de Lusignan lose it? Hmm. Many maneuvers took place. There's a man called Raymond of Tripoli who plays a very kind of Machiavellian role between this. Salah al-Din had contacts with him. Hmm. So Raymond wanted to be the king of Jerusalem rather than Guy. He spoke Arabic. But, you know, the story is that um, there were those within the camp, the Christian camp, the Frank's camp, who understood. There were those who believed that you could still have a rapprochement with Salah al-Din, hmm. like Raymond. Leave him alone. And like the other Muslim leaders, maybe you can buy him off. You can do this, you know, how corrupt, you know, you can figure out something and live and let live policy. Yes. There were those like Reno of Châtillon, despite his kind of, you know, uh, despicable image that he's given, which he fully deserved, um, who understood that Salah al-Din was unlike the others, right. that there was no compromise with this man. Yes. He was, he's going to get them. And they were saying, strike now before this man gets too powerful. And they were the ones who convinced Baldwin to fight. Mm. 
and they were very uh, fortunate. They won a battle, but of course, one battle doesn't mean anything anymore mm -hmm. because Salahuddin was getting more and more powerful. In 1187, when this man had armies coming from all over the Muslim world, gathering under his command, Guide de Lusignan had a choice. It was too late to compromise. The die had been cast. At the same time, we've got to remember that the Kingdom of Jerusalem was desperately sending messages to Europe. Come and help us. Send us money to Henry II of England, the King of France. We need help. We're running out of money. We don't have money. We're going to lose Jerusalem. Mm. But Europe was obsessed with Europe and there were no there's no real help coming in. Wow. Okay. It all comes to the fact that Salah Haddin had to convince the Christian army to move from its position, where it was positioned. And how did he do so? He attacked a city called Tiberias, mm. which was where Raymond, de, uh, Raymond of Tripoli's wife was there. And Raymond himself went to lead the and said, do not move. This is just a trick. Really? Do not move. Even so, though his wife is now... And, yeah. and the reason he said that, said, because we know Salah Haddin is an honorable man. <laughs> this man is not going to do anything. Yes. He's a man of great honor and dignity. Yes. He's not going to... Uh, has, he's going to hurt women. Of course he's not going to hurt women. Yes. There were those in the camp who said, no, this is too late. We have to fight the Salah Haddin yeah. because this man is not going to give up. Guy de Lusignan listened to the camp, the Reign of Chatillon camp. Mm -hmm. And on that strategic day in July... 1187, he marched his army, he was still, it's a, it's a big story, but he marched his army and Salah Haddin saw his chance and, and launched his two commanders. On his right wing, there was his nephew, Taqiyuddin, who was a great general, and on his left wing, there was his, I think his brother-in-law, Kukburi, who was mm. one of his generals. Yes. And they won an astonishing victory. Wow. And on that day, the whole senior leadership of the Christian army was crushed on one day. It was a victory beyond any measure, beyond anyone's imagination. Yes. Because all the knights and all the counts of the Christian kingdom had come together on that day, yes. except Raymond Tripoli who had escaped on that day, but he dies later. Mm -hmm. Some say out of heartbreak, some say he had no heart <laughs> to break. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then of course, Salah Haddin is victorious. Finally, for 10 years, he's been saying to the Syrians and the Egyptians, trust me, I'm going to deliver Jerusalem. Yes. He delivers it. He meets with Guy de Lusignan yes. and René of Chatillon. And there's this famous story where René of Chatillon earlier had attacked a caravan which supposed to have had Salah Haddin's sister on it. It's not true. She okay. was not on the caravan. Yeah. But the men, he, I mean, Salah Haddin, of course, because of René's attack on Medina. Mm. And as soon as René of Chatillon and Guy de Lusignan come into Salah Haddin's camp, he gives water to Guy de Lusignan, but he does not offer water to Reno because he was not going to show him any mercy. Mm. And he orders the chopping of Reno's head off. Wow. And Guy looks at this, the king of Jerusalem, looks at this and says, you know, he thinks, I'm going to be next. And Salah Haddin said to him, no, don't worry. Kings do not kill kings. But this man had transgressed the boundaries of decency. Mm. In 1187, Salah Haddin had achieved what he promised to achieve. He had achieved what Nuruddin had attempted, what Ahmad al-Din Zengi could only have dreamt of. Mm. 88 years after the fall of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was restored to Muslim lands, owners, and remained so, of course, until the 20th century. So tell me about the chivalry that uh, the West knows Salahuddin by, how he dealt yeah. with uh, the Crusaders. This is the most... Uh, fascinating part in a way because yeah. it's the one which actually brings out Salah Hadin. You know, the, the Salah Hadin I've described so far mm. is a military warlord who's won victories, but we still don't know him. Now we get to know who he is. Right. And actually, we get to know who he is because of Hattin. We've spoken about a few months later, Jerusalem falls, and as I explained, he shows incredible mercy. Mm. There's no massacres. Mm. But that's three of the Salah Hadin we still know. The real acts of chivalry and love and honor and dignity that has made him so famous and beloved happens when he knew, he knew with a clarity. As soon as Jerusalem fell, he knew Europe would not accept this. Right. He knew that this would unleash a huge response 
I understand the Pope had a heart attack and this, died. Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> who knows? I mean, you know, chronicles are chronicles. Yes. It's colorful stories. <laughs> um, as soon as that happened, the Third Crusade was launched. Right. The King of France, the King of England, of course, the famous Richard, Germany, all put together their armies. Can imagine those three countries coming together with their armies. Mm. We need to get Jerusalem back. Mm. On the other hand, Salah al-Din, his army was exhausted. They had just won a fantastic victory, victory beyond imagination. Yes. These people are not going to hang around and fight more. <laughs> they just wanted to go back to even Taqiyuddin, who was his nephew, who was this incredible warrior. Even his own nephew said to him, enough. You've been fighting jihad for so many years. How many more times can we fight jihad? Let's go back. Let's enjoy ourselves. Let's mm. relax. Yes. But Salah al-Din knew there was a storm coming. Right. And the storm manifested itself in the shape of Richard. And the Third Crusade is really the seismic war of attrition between these two incredible leaders. Yes. One determined to capture Jerusalem, one determined to prevent him from capturing Jerusalem with a much weaker army. Salah al-Din no longer had the army he had at mm -hmm. Latin because they had all left. Mm -hmm. And he was fighting a defensive war as Richard lands in, uh, on the coast. The first one, there's this, this uh, siege and then the massacre of Acre where 3,000 people are massacred by Richard, Muslims. And this is a signal that this is not going to take you know, any prisoners. He's, there's a man who's going to march and capture Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And Salah al-Din is now fighting him. And this is the, the, the version of Salah al-Din we all know, Richard and Salah al-Din. Of course, contrary to popular belief, the two men never met. Right. There was this thing about the meeting. They never met, of course. But Salah al brother, I think, Salah met Salah al brother met him yeah. because Salah, Richard was desperate to meet with Salah al He'd heard a lot about him. Yes. Salah al refused to meet him because he just didn't feel there was a need to meet him. And again, diplomatically, he says to him, you know, if kings were to meet, then, you know, it's not becoming that they should fight afterwards. So let's meet when it's all over. <laughs> but of course, he never wanted to meet him. And this is the time when Salah al chivalry appears. We get these incredible stories where in one famous battle, Richard's horse is slain and uh, he falls on the ground and had Richard been captured by the Muslims this would of course have been you know, game over really effectively hmm. but when news reaches Salah al that Richard's horse has been slain he immediately sends two horses to Richard because he says it's not befitting for a king to fight on the ground hmm. when Richard falls ill with a tremendous fever Salah al sends him his doctors and sends him sherbet uh, you know, sorbet from, which, from Lebanon with ice. And he also takes Salah al uh, Richard's uh, men into his camp and he's very generous to them. Now, on the one hand, one sees it as an act of generosity, mm. but there's a much more subtle, much more wise thinking behind it. Salah al wanted to show Richard how powerful and how grand he was. You're ill, I'll send you, sure, you know, sorbet. You're, 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 you fall on the ground, I'm going to send you horses. Come, look at my camp. Look at the cooks. And he showed them the amount of kitchens and cooks and the food that was coming out. And he <laughs> sent them food. And as he said to him, very cleverly, he was older than Richard. He was about, I guess, 20 years older than Richard now. Salah was in his 50s, mm. exhausted by years of fighting. And he writes Richard a letter, says, look, I'm here on my own home ground. I'm surrounded by my children, <laughs> my grandchildren. I can keep on doing this. You are so far away. And mm. at that time, I don't know how, but you must have known that King John, Richard's brother, was playing games in England. Yes. Look at what's happening. Are you sure you're safe back there? <laughs> so there's a very clever, you know, diplomacy taking place. He was a remarkable man. There are stories which are, you know, many of Richard's, uh, Salah al stories of chivalry were taken back to Europe by those who came across. And that is why the He's become so famous in Europe because of that. Yeah. The Frankish woman whose son was lost in a battle, her two-year-old, three-year-old son was lost in a battle, and she's completely um, out of her mind. And she's asking all the soldiers, the Christian, the Frank soldiers, where have you seen my son? And they actually say to her, no, we don't. But if you go to the Muslim camp and ask about Salah al-Din, he will help you find it because right. this is a man who will help you. Mm. She does. She goes. He listens to her. He sends out people and he finds, you know, reunites with her son. These are not stories made up in the Thousand and One Nights. These are real, historically accurate stories of a man who acted with a generosity mm. and with a diplomacy, which was astonishing. 
And that is why Salah al-Din is so greatly loved, both by the Muslims and so greatly respected by the Europeans. But here is a fundamental point to make. In his chivalry, in his honor, in his dignity, in his decorum, Salah al-Din was doing nothing but trying to live and enact his life according to the principles of the Prophet. He was a Muslim. Yes. He was a deeply pious Muslim. He was acting thus because this is the example that was given to him by the Sira. Mm. The problem is the Europeans, when they came across this chivalry, could not accept that these principles were driven by his Islamic belief because right. they did not see Islam as a religion, as, as they saw it as a false religion. Yes. So they had to dissociate his actions from his religious beliefs. Mm. And we find this manifested at its clearest point in Dante's Divine Comedy, yeah. where both Salah al-Din and the Prophet are mentioned. Yes. And what is fascinating is that Dante places Salah al-Din in a circle of hell which is higher, which is, means less hellish mm. than the Prophet, because the Prophet was a false prophet who had to be fought. Mm. Salah al-Din was a Muslim and that caused him problems, but he was so honorable that he was actually placed with Achilles and with the Greek warriors and heroes. Yes. So he could not be Christian. Yes. His soul was damned. He was in hell. But you cannot deny his chivalry. Yeah. So they, there was a kind of almost existential dilemma about this man who clearly was manifesting the principles of Islam at their highest and their most noble and showing such chivalry to his enemies mm. that they could not deny it, but they could not accept it. Mm. Because if you drew the logical conclusion, yes. then that means that the Islamic faith is a valid religion. Yeah. Salah al-Din spends the next two years of his life fighting Richard. Hmm. He's exhausted. He's broken by it. And he cannot stop Richard. Richard slowly makes his way down the coast. And he's about to capture Jerusalem. And if one were to say, what is Salah al-Din's greatest achievement? You could say his greatest achievement was capturing Jerusalem. You could say his greatest achievement was the restoring Sunni rule to Egypt. Mm. His greatest achievement was making sure that Jerusalem did not fall back. And he could have, and this is again where we, we look at that. There's many, many interesting aspects to this. Mm. He could have left, retreated from Jerusalem and gone back to Egypt. Right. Knowing that Richard could not reach him in Egypt. The supply lines would have been too great for Richard and he didn't have the amount. He could have, Egypt was still powerful. He could have remained in Egypt, consolidated his power, and then made another attempt to capture Jerusalem. Yeah. That was one option to, for him to do. Yeah. Yeah. He refused to do so. He made it very clear that he would live and die fighting and defending Jerusalem. So when he knew that everything was lost and that there's no way he could stop Richard from capturing Jerusalem, he ordered the tearing down of the walls of Ascalon. Again, very important because who controlled Ascalon controls Egypt by tearing down the walls that rendered the city useless for Richard. Mm. He then retreat, retreated into Jerusalem with a very small team now. There was no longer an army there because most of the Muslims had completely dispersed. And it was winter. He poisoned, literally poisoned the wells around Jerusalem. And he told his people around him that I will fight to the end. I will not surrender the city. And there's this extremely moving scene where he's sitting very quietly with those most loyal to him, one of whom was very interesting, and I'll come back to that. And he actually speaks to them. And at first there's Ibn, Ibn Shaddad, who's the historian, the biographer, he's present, he describes the scene, he said, the men were sitting very quietly, completely still, they're all lost in their thought. Of course, the responsibility of what's going to happen, the attack on Jerusalem was coming closer and closer. And he said the men were sitting so still that birds could have perched on their heads in silence. And then Salah al-Din speaks and says to them, I have made my decision. I will fight to the end here. I will mm. die here. I will not leave the city anymore. And one of the people, then his commander stands up. And that man who stands up was a man who for many years had fought Salah al-Din, had his own ambition, mm. had wanted to be vizier, had known him ever since Egypt, you know, 30 years earlier, mm. who had vowed with him. But the fact that he was present with Salah al-Din at the end shows that they had transcended any rivalry. Yeah. By this point, people knew that this man was genuine.
This was not a warlord looking to control his domains. He would have gone back to Egypt had he done. Yeah, yeah. And he stands by him and says, I too will die with you. So this is almost a confirmation of how the, those people who initially had claimed he was a dog that Bart against his master had been won over by the qualities of this person. And they decide to fight to the end and die in Jerusalem rather than Richard captured. And it seemed as if nothing could stop Richard. Except Richard never captures it. <laughs> he never gets to Jerusalem. And for that, there are many reasons. Yeah. Um, so Salah al-Din, eventually Richard realizes he cannot capture Jerusalem for the reason that we mentioned earlier on. Those around him said to him, what's the point? You capture Jerusalem, the Muslims will regroup an army yeah. and capture Jerusalem again. Yeah. Either go and capture Egypt, which is where the key is, mm. but you cannot because your army is too... And by then he had fought bitterly, bitterly and bitterly. Mm. So there are some peace terms. And defined to the end, Richard says to Salah al-Din, yeah, I don't think you've won. I'll be back. I'm just going to go back to Europe and I'm going to come back and fight you. And of course, Salah al-Din, as diplomatic as ever, says, sure, I look forward to it. <laughs> you know? and what, yeah. what do you make of the... I don't know if it's a claim, if there's a historical uh, evidence for it, but uh, after the, uh, when the British and the French, when they conquer mm. Jerusalem during the First World War, mm. the, fa the French general Liotte, yeah. goes to the grave of Salahuddin. I have returned, yeah. I have returned, is that... That is true, absolutely. Really? No, no, it happened, of course, Bin Bashar Liotte, I have returned. And it shows you again the complete obsession. And this actually leads to the point, to, to finish my story, Richard leaves... Mm. Jerusalem is saved. By then, Salah al his health is broken right. by this enormous pressure. He goes back to Damascus and he dies within two years. Penniless. Yeah. Qadil Fadl with him at the end. Mm -hmm. And there is total, total mourning in the Muslim world. And again, if one were to look at the reflection of who this man was, the way that people who hated him literally just, be, you know, and this is a beautiful description. As the news of Salah al-Din's death, the wave of that news began to spread, the Muslims started to cry and break down because they realized this is something which was not coming again. This was a brief moment in history mm. where this person managed to transcend their selfish you know, ambitions into something nobler. Then, to come back to your point, yeah. we move to the 19th century. So 800 years later, the Europeans never forgot Salah al-Din. They took back the stories of Salah al-Din, as we said, Dante's Divine Comedy, Europe, the myth of Salah al-Din. Saladin became this legendary hero. Mm. I would argue more in Europe than in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. Really? Because the Muslims had Jerusalem. What makes the story of Salah al-Din so poignant was that in the 19th century, with colonialism, with the return of the British and the French into um, the, the, the Middle East, Damascus, and of course with Jerusalem going back uh, uh, away from Muslim hands, suddenly Salah al-Din emerges again as the hero. Mm. But for hundreds of years, Salah al-Din was, if not forgotten, he was just a Muslim hero like Baybars, like Nurdin bin Zengi, like Mahmoud of Ghazna, like... Uh, Rahman al Dakh III, like um, many other Muslim heroes yes. who contribute to fighting for Islam. It's only when post colonialism and then, you know, that the, Muslim, the Middle East found itself on the defensive that the image or the legend of Salah al Din started to emerge. But of course, what emerges then has very little to do with the actual reality which is a man who fought realpolitik, who had great chivalry and personal virtues, but who also was a man of his time. Yes. The Salah al-Din we talk about today has actually very little connection with the historical Salah al-Din. And we see it on both sides. We see it, as you mentioned, the Europeans' obsession with Salah al-Din. Don't forget that the mausoleum of Salah al-Din in Damascus yes. was restored by Kaiser Wilhelm II mm. of Prussia. <laughs> this, again, was the obsession, this complete fascination. And I, I repeat what I said, this fascination with Salah al-Din is because they could not accept their fascination with the Prophet. Mm. They had to substitute, they cannot, mm. because that was asking too much of them. Yeah. So Salah al-Din represented a safe alternative. Yes. But then the obsession 
also manifested itself in the Arab world. And you get leaders in the 20th century like Saddam Hussein, like Yasser yeah. Arafat, yeah. like uh, Hafs and Assad, who all assumed certain mantles. So, you know, statues of Salah al-Din have emerged in the Arab world in Damascus. Yes. Yusuf Shaheen in the 1960s made a very famous film, uh, uh, a very famous film. Yusuf Shaheen was an Egyptian director. Mm. And this was the time of Abdel Nasser in Egypt. And suddenly Salah al-Din emerges again as the hero who somehow will unite the Arabs, restore past glories, soothe the wounds of the Arabs and Muslims. Mm. I repeat, this Salah al-Din absolutely no connection with the historic Salah al -Din. Yeah. His name has been taken over. Mm. Uh, and that is why, to return to your initial question. Yes, the big question, yeah. do we need another Salah al -Din today in the Muslim world? I repeat the answer. When people ask that question, what do they mean when they say Salah al -Din? Mm. Um, How much does the question, do we need another Salah al -Din? How much is that an abrogating of our responsibility? Yes, we need an Asal Hadim because we can't be bothered to get off our own backside mm. and fix our problems. Uh, no, we cannot have another Salah Hadim. No. To have a Salah Hadim, we need to have an age which can produce a Salah Hadim. Mm. And what is so interesting about Salah Hadim and this? not the historic Salah al-Din, but the Salah al-Din that people talk about today, is they talk about Salah al-Din, they talk about his capture of Jerusalem, as I mentioned, but if you were to ask them, fine, but Salah al-Din did not fight and win Jerusalem single-handedly. Name me another person who was with Salah al-Din. Mm. These people would struggle. And that shows that they actually know nothing about the historical character, and that also shows that it's not realistic what they're saying. Mm. Salah al-Din was Salah al-Din because the age in which he lived allowed him to become Salah al-Din and he was supported by incredible giants. We mentioned people who lived before him, the Nizam al-Mulk, Ghazali, people who were contemporary with him, like I did not mention, but who deserves, he's mentioned in my book, deserves huge credit, the great Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani in Baghdad, whose influence on Salah al-Din was phenomenal, although the men never met. And Salah al-Din, he dies when Salah al-Din was 30 years old. And yet people around the Qad al-Jilani, around Salah al-Din, like the great Hanbali jurist, Mufaq al-Din ibn Qudama, like uh, the, the chief judge Ibn Abi Asrun, like the man who gave the, uh, the final sermon in uh, Jerusalem, Zain al-Din ibn Naja, were all disciples and students of the Qad al-Jilani. We are talking about people like I mentioned Al-Qadi Al-Fadl, the administrators. We're talking about the heroes, the unsung heroes, who we know, whose names we do not know, who gave so much of their money to build madrasas to, for pietistic reasons. And all this produced an age which allowed somebody like Salah al to emerge. How do we reproduce this age today? This may well, be... We can't reproduce this age. And I think I have to say one thing which I find... Um, which irritates me, I must say, <laughs> which is the uh, narrative of decline. Yeah. I think we're in a wonderful position. The Muslim world is in a wonderful position. I disagree fundamentally with those who believe that somehow we're in a mess and we should be looking at the golden age. I think, if nothing else, today I've tried to talk about the fact that there never was a golden age, that when you look at the history of Islam, you say, oh, this was a golden age. When the Mamluk dynasties were at their height, when the 12th and 13th century, the great, great move advances in science and knowledge and astronomy was the same time when the Mongols were destroying Baghdad and actually riding their horses in the mm. mosque and destroying the Qurans. Mm. When you look at something like Timur Lang and the great Timur dynasty, which allowed incredible advances with the famous Nasruddin and Tusi, and his observatory and the great scientific advantages of that golden age, Timur was building pyramids of skulls. The narrative of a golden age is one that doesn't resonate with me. Mm. And neither does each age. Each age has its own weakness and each age has its own strength. And one has to look at it in a dispassionate, objective and intelligent manner. Today, 
we live in a wonderful age because we have to understand Islam is a timeless and universal religion, mm. which means the age in which we're living has its own destiny to, to contribute to Islam. God is with us today as he was in the golden age. The example of the Prophet is here today as it was then. So this harking back, I do not think serves any purpose. Mm. I am extremely positive. I am extremely encouraged by the young generation of Muslims that are emerging, who are using technology, who are using their intelligence, who are trying to maintain their traditional values and traditional beliefs in a world which is changing very fast. So the narrative of decline and what we need to do is, 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 is has, well, what we need to do should not be seen within a narrative of decline. It should be seen within a narrative contribution. Mm -hmm. Muslims today, they need to be humble, but they also need to be brave. They need to be humble because they need to go back and need to study. They need education as the boring answer to your question is education, but that's, there is no quick answer. Mm -hmm. They need to study, but they need to study with humility. One of the things that alarms me is the number of people now online who are very quick to pass fatwas and to mm -hmm. make judgments and say this is a kafir and this is this and that based on just, you know, cursory reading of texts without really understanding the Arabic, which is absolutely key to, to mm -hmm. it. So one needs to understand and study with great humility the scholars of the past and give them the respect. And at the same time, one has to understand they need to be brave. I say that some of the issues and some of the way that you know, Islamic scholarship, the problems that Islamic scholarship was dealing with, they were dealing about issues that took place centuries ago. The world has changed. The world is still God's world. The example of the Prophet, I saw Salam, is still there, but yes. the world has changed and Muslims have to realize. And the biggest change that has taken place, in my opinion, and what makes this age unlike any other age in which we live, is secularism mm. and atheism. And I can guarantee you, as a historian, that there has never been a dynasty, there has never been a civilization mm. up to this modern civilization which has not had some religious and spiritual beliefs. Mm -hmm. We may not have understood them, whether it's the human sacrifice for the Incas or, you know, but these, they were based on an eschatology, on a transcendent belief of some sacred principles, mm -hmm. and which we perhaps don't understand, but which one accepted. Mm -hmm. We mentioned very quickly Baldwin. Mm -hmm. How can you not be moved by Baldwin's piety? Mm -hmm. Here were the Crusaders who were coming, and both sides were fighting to the death because they both believed. The age in which we live today is one that does not believe in the sacred. It's the age which is underpinned by a liberalism which reduces everything to a certain level, what I call a tyranny of liberalism. But at the same time, the strength of it is that it allows us to maneuver and act and organize ourselves and build bridges. And I think one of the most important things for Muslims today and not just to build bridges, it's to transcend the, you know, the sort of the madahib disputes, the kind of, you know, this dispute about this or that. Mm. We live in a world which is destroying itself. Mm. Where is the Islamic response? Stop thinking about whether this madhab wrote this or whether Ibn Taymiyyah had written that. And the, because people are still harking back to these disputes. Yes. Open your eyes. Realize that we live in a world unlike any other world, that the challenge that liberalism poses for us and for our children mm. is very grave, poses the fact that the environmental destruction is eventually going to finish us off, mm. and whether we're Muslim or not, mm. but also looks at the incredible opportunities to build bridges. In a, we're sitting in a place like London, mm. and yet we are speaking to people across the world. Yes. These are the bridges, so we no longer think about an ummah, not an ummah. And these unique opportunities makes me extremely positive because I think to have despair is the worst crime you can have as a Muslim.
Dr. Abdurrahman Azam, you've taken us on a, a fantastic journey and I, I'm enlightened by the life of Salahuddin in the way you've told the story. And uh, your book is Salahuddin, The Triumph of the Sunni Revival. And Jazakallah Khair, thank you very much for your time today. Barakallah, and thank you for being patient with me as I yes. went through the sword. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah Khair.